time as a civil rights activist. What was that like? What did you do? Well, it was very exciting times. Uh, I started qu quite young. You know, I was born and I came up early in the early civil rights struggle. Uh, my first experience was uh, in college as a freshman, uh, um, marching uh, to, to the shopping center. It was Northwood Shopping Center, which was a, um, a segregated shopping center that was located uh, in the heart of uh, Baltimore, where Morgan State University was located. And uh, we weren't allowed to um, eat or go to the movies. So uh, there was some students from Philadelphia that were students at Morgan and they organized um, uh, the other students into going over demonstrating and we would go over every day and uh, the band would lead us over and we'd march and sing. And um, during this time, um, there were um, uh, segregated parts of Baltimore where we could go where they had the movies, but out where the school was, um, it was segregated and uh, we couldn't uh, um, attend the movies. Uh, we couldn't uh, go to the restaurants. Uh, we could take the food out, but we couldn't eat there. And um, during our four years, we still didn't succeed with the integration, but we put a lot of pressure on them. And the uh, succeeding students that came in the following years, eventually they were able to break the segregation down. Uh, another great experience I had at Morgan, I was in the band. And uh, during that time, uh, Martin Luther King came to be the commencement speaker. And uh, I was as close as you and I are right now. Uh, when he spoke, because I was in the band, so we were down in the pit, which was right in front of the stage. And uh, that was the year he had just won the Nobel Peace Prize. So that was uh, quite a uh, an experience, you know, on a person, just a young person in college, and I never forgot it. And uh, even today, I still cherish that as one of the great members of being in the, in the presence of the great Dr. Martin Luther King. When I left there, I went to Indiana, I graduated, and um, uh, we had the NAACP there, and I was uh, one of the advisors, and one of, one of our jobs was to recruit the young people to go on the freedom marches and the, and the, um, uh, the bus rides. And I had an opportunity to go on I was on the bus that went to Nashville, which was the bus that was supposed to connect with the bus that the segregationists burned down in Birmingham. So I escaped that by having to be back at work that Monday because we only went as far as Nashville. And we came back and then another group of Freedom Riders took our place in Nashville and went on to uh, Birmingham. And if you know about history, uh, the civil rights, the segregation burned that particular bus that particular day. So I barely escaped that. And um, I also had an opportunity to go on the first uh, march to Washington. And uh, when I came back here and got involved with the NAACP, I was fortunate enough to go on the, and lead the Virginia delegation to the 25th anniversary of that march. So. Um, there have been some great experiences, and um, uh, I was president of the NAACP at one time, and um, we um, were involved with the fight to close Narcom High School because Narcom was started as a segregated high school. And as integration progressed, um, there was movement to close the black high schools all over Virginia, and Narcom and Booker T were the only ones remaining. So that was a big fight that we had an opportunity to win to keep Narcom uh, preserved and probably just uh, saw on TV where they had the 145th anniversary, didn't you? Yeah, y'all probably did a story on it. I think you did. Yes. So you, you have a lot of experience, you know, in such pivotal times during yeah. the Civil Rights Act, of, you know, a Civil Rights era. And I know it's an obvious question, it's an obvious answer, why were you so motivated to be involved in something like that? It's a huge deal. Well, because, you know, my parents had worked so hard and they were um, real skilled and they were very smart and intelligent. And um, they weren't allowed to do some of the things that they should have been able to do 
uh, like uh, owning their own businesses where everybody could come and patronize. My mother was a great cook. We should have had a big restaurant. And um, my, my granddaddy uh, was in business, but he could only um, uh, sell to people in the neighborhood, which was a segregated neighborhood. And um, of course, I grew up in a segregated neighborhood because during that time, uh, equal housing wasn't available. And um, they weren't exactly the best neighborhoods. Some of the houses were run down and some of them were, um, were luxury homes. They were all in the same section, which was um, called Lincolnville, which was named after uh, Abraham Lincoln. It was one of the um, early settlements here in Portsmouth, but it was segregated and uh, we, we couldn't live in the um, nicer homes in general. When um, uh, the Caucasians moved out, we would move in, but there were very few. Afro-Americans at the time could uh, possess the, the dream of owning their own home. And so I dreamed of things like that, owning my own home, you know, having my own business, um, going to um, integrated college. Uh, but those things were denied at the time. So um, even um, the beach, you know, going to the beach, uh, we had segregated beaches and you know, couldn't imagine a million years, uh, the water being separated but uh, the beaches were separated and the water fountains. Uh, we have one over, you see the fountain over here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got a picture of it too. That was a colored water fountain. Mm -hmm. yeah, we couldn't drink out of the same water fountain. So um, imagine being denied um, simple privileges like that. The, the average young person nowadays n never thought it actually existed. I got put in jail the first day I went to college because um, we were at the bus stop and it was Baltimore and I had Baltimore mixed up with Delaware. I thought it was the Mason-Dixon line. You know, when you got to Delaware, you supposed yeah. to be um, able to uh, do anything you want as far as uh, being equal. So you said, wait, you got arrested at one point? In Baltimore, we were at the White Castle restaurant and, we, and everybody at the bus stop was black. No, no white people at the bus stop. I mean, we went in the station, they had these, um, White Castle Hamburgs, and during the time they were 10 for a dollar. <laughs> they didn't have a White Castle here, but it was well advertised. Everybody knew about White Castle Hamburgers. You've heard of them. We got to get some of these White Castle Hamburgers. And we all went into, nobody there but us at the bus stop, all black people. But you weren't supposed to go to the front to get the White Castle Hamburgers. Go to the back mm -hmm. in Baltimore. Must have been 30 or 40 of us there. But the, um, you know, it's unfortunate. So did you go to the front? Is that why? What, what happened? You got arrested? Of course, we were in the front. We, you know, we ordered from the front. And how'd that feel? What was that like for you? What? Getting arrested? Like, just, just. Well, I guess, um, the reason they arrested me was the fact that the, um, when I told the police that I was from Virginia, and so he said I should have known better. But I really hadn't experienced that much segregation because um, well, I went to a black high school and we had great teachers, great sports. And um, the bus line that I went on, on um, you were supposed to sit in the back, but it was an all black bus route and it, everybody that got on the bus went to a black neighborhood. So we always sat anywhere on the bus, anywhere. And we had a lot of great black restaurants. So I really had never been to a, a, a white restaurant. Mm -hmm. And um, I forgot I forgot, I was supposed to go to the back because we had great restaurants here in the black neighborhood. And everybody, what they call it, you heard the term soul food? Mm -hmm. Everybody loves soul food, you know? And so um, um, there wasn't any need for me. And so I, I really uh, hadn't, hadn't experienced that, that much segregation, although I knew it was there, but, um, when I got to Baltimore, I really had thought I had picked a college, you know, that was 
um, I'd be equal, you know, because I just got Delaware. My geography was, was, was bad. <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking Delaware. Um, you familiar with the term Mason Dixon line? Well, you're very smart for a young person. <laughs> when you got to the Mason Dixon line, you were equal. You could do anything you wanted, and everyone looked forward to that. You know, you could, um, when they used to ride the bus, you should see the people in the back, and then all of a sudden they get to Delaware. Everybody <laughs> would get a, you know, would move up front because that was quite an experience, you know, to sit up front of the bus. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I just didn't, I should have known better, but I just didn't, you know. And uh, we didn't think about um, violating one of the laws at the time. Uh, we just wanted those White Castle hamburgers. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't have one year at the time. And the, the focus of our story uh, for this report, um, have, you, have you heard about Governor Yunkin and Governor Ron DeSantis in Florida um, getting like pushing out African American history courses? Have you heard of uh, vaguely? Governor yes, not Ron a whole lot. I've heard, I've heard, yeah, uh, Florida's governor um, um, is you know, very, very controversial. And part of his controversial, you know, motivations and attitudes is that he's, he basically said, and this is a true statement, that he didn't want critical race theory and certain historical lessons involving slavery because he didn't, he said that people should not feel guilty about that history. And it's a very, very controversial statement, and it's creating this narrative um, that, that we should not be learning black history, that we should not be learning African-American history, that critical race theory is not necessary, but it is. Yes. Well, it's important, especially for the young people, because if they don't know where they came from, they're not going to know where they're going. And uh, Afro-American history is a part, I, I know, when I was in school, we studied the history of Virginia. And um, when I went to college, uh, that was a new experience because we had black history. And I had been denied, like some of the young people nowadays, uh, they've been denied an opportunity or they don't know anything about uh, Afro-American history. And um, now on some of the college campuses, the, the Afro-American history course is just as popular with the white and the Spanish kids as it is the black kids because they everybody wants to know about the history because there's um, a lot of great history involved that, that we never knew because growing up, I never, I always watched Westerns, they're my favorite. I never knew there was a black cowboy, you know, because I always went to the movies and um, John Wayne and Roy Rogers and all those guys were, were my heroes, you know. And um, there were, um, since black history come along, they've taught us that there were, there were black um, cowboys, black cowgirls, and everything, you know? When you hear about that, because critical race theory is just, you know, it, it's so important. It talks about, you know, how race played, racism played a huge part in our history and our behaviors in our society. When you hear about that, you know, as somebody who's, who fought against racism and segregation, what was your thoughts? Well, um, as far as the classroom is concerned, I'm a firm believer, you know, uh, as a substitute, that you follow the lesson plan. If it's part of the lesson plan, then, you know, you teach it. If it's not part of the lesson plan, uh, don't get into your personal uh, types of opinions because uh, when you get into race and you get into religious, you're going to offend a lot of people uh, that are not part of that particular program. So um, I'm a firm believer that uh, if, it's, it's, if it's in the curriculum and it's part of the plan, then you, you st stick right with it. And like you, you talk about the importance of people understanding the impacts of slavery, the impacts of segregation to this day, and how, how it still has impacts on our society, right? Yes. Why is it so important for, especially young children, to know, just to understand, not just to read about it, not just to memorize it for a test, 
but to truly understand the core of these historical problems in our nation. Yes. Well, it's necessary for, for them to know because they're going to have to be parents themselves one day, and they're going to have to teach their children what their four parents went through. And it's important that the generations coming after us know our story and they remember and they hope that the next generation never ever have to encounter what some of our parents and grandparents encountered. And regarding the Florida governor's remarks that he made saying that, talking about certain topics like the details, the harsh details of slavery, he talked about how it could make people like young students feel guilty for something they personally didn't do. You mean young white students or black students? White students. See, that's what he was talking about. Yes. I'm well, quoting him, just like, no, it's not Right, <laughs> yeah. Well, it was their parents, and I mean, I, I don't think that they actually feel guilty of something that their parents done. And um, some of them, um, like, for example, some of the um, universities, some of the students there, they have took courses and they um, have felt sorry for some of the things their parents have done. And they've established scholarships in their parents' names to help um, Afro-Americans uh, to forgive for what their parents did. And then some of them are also um, naming buildings after um, uh, some outstanding Afro-Americans because of some of the um, people that were um, offensive to blacks, uh, owned slaves, or uh, fought in the Civil War. And, and uh, you probably kept, or even right here, we went through the process of taking down the names of schools and buildings. And um, even um, uh, my associate um, uh, was one of them that was um, responsible for taking the statue down, which was a, uh, a evil saw right in the middle of um, High Street, our main um, source of traveling from the waterfront to other parts of Portsmouth. And um, we as Afro-Americans um, uh, sometimes don't like to be reminded of uh, um, many of the evils that were done to us back in uh, many, many years ago. Exactly. But it's, it's, it's painful to be reminded of it. Um, but it's important to never forget, right? Yes. And um, there have been a lot of movies, you know, which uh, uh, a lot of the young people get an opportunity to see. And, and, and some of them, um, uh, Roots, you recall that, that, that did a lot to, to um, um, make the young people be remindful of the evils of slavery and how, um, I mean, unless you were there or your parents told you about it, you couldn't imagine how, what a horrible experience that could have been. Alive. Yes, definitely. In the classroom, yeah. Right, and it's groups like the Afro-American Society and the NAACP, and um, uh, not only in the classroom, but they, they keep it alive in the community too, and uh, which is very important too, that um, the churches and the community um, uh, constantly let people know that um, uh, uh, how things used to be and that um, hopefully we never have another day like that again.